All right, let's talk about these questions. Number one, the awkwardness in this conversation. So at this point in the story, Anne has left Lyme. She's staying, I believe, at uh, Upper Cross. No, no, she's she has arrived at Bath and is talking with Lady Russell about everything that happened at Lyme. And Lady Russell already knows the basic information, but she wants to hear the story in detail from Anne. Um, as it says here on page 82, they must speak of the accident at Lyme. Lady Russell had not been arrived five minutes the day before when a full account of the whole had burst on her. In other words, as soon as she arrived at Bath, somebody was very eagerly telling her what happened at Lyme. Also notice the grammar. Today we don't say been arrived, we simply say arrived. But still it must be talked of. She, uh, Lady Russell, must make inquiries. Uh, if you spell inquiries in the American style, it is I-N, not E-N. It just means she asks questions. She must regret the imprudence. Uh, basically, uh, she has to say something like, I'm sorry to be, uh, I'm sorry to ask you about these things. It's considered impolite to keep asking somebody for information. If they want to tell you, they will tell you themselves. Um, lament the results because it's a, you know, the accident is a bad thing. And here's the key point. Captain Wentworth's name must be mentioned by both. Anne was conscious of not doing it so well as Lady Russell. So this tells us there is an awkwardness about Captain Wentworth's name, right? Lady Russell is the person who persuaded Anne to break up with him. And yet, Apparently, Lady Russell feels no regret because whenever she mentions Wentworth, she can do it perfectly fine. But Anne, Anne could not speak the name and look straight forward to Lady Russell's eye. Today, we would say, look Lady Russell in the eye. Till she had adopted the expedient. Adopt means to, to, to take up a, a way. Expedient is a shortcut. It's a it's a way to do something. Of telling her briefly what she thought of the attachment or relationship between him and Louisa. When this was told, his name distressed her no longer. She no longer felt awkward. So the question is, what's going on here? We understand why she feels awkward, but how does this solution get rid of the awkwardness. Why does mentioning him in relation to Louisa solve this problem? I talked with a few groups about this question. The basic idea here is that um, you can't just mention a random person in conversation. You have to explain why you are talking about them. Just like in real life, when you meet somebody new, you have to wait for someone to introduce you. In conversation, when you bring somebody new into the story, you have to introduce that person. In other words, in order to talk about Wentworth, Anne has to explain his relationship to somebody in the story. And for Anne, the most direct relationship is that he is her ex-boyfriend. But that's exactly why she feels so awkward. So instead, she finds a different relationship his relationship with Louisa. Uh, and so they get over the awkward part of why are you talking about him? Now they have a reason to talk about him. And so she no longer feels awkward about it. One way to think about this is to say that she was able to deal with Wentworth like a stranger and to think about him and talk about him like a stranger. 
and so it makes it less awkward. Question two. Uh, a few groups also took this question. Visits of charity in the village. So we know that Lynch is a piece of land owned by Sir Walter. They live in the main building, Kellynch Hall. There is a guest house where Lady Russell lives. And then there are farmers and shepherds who live also on the land in the village, Kellynch village. The idea here is that the land is owned by the noble family in a feudal system. So the villagers have to feed and take care of the nobles and the nobles have to take care, like protect the villagers. Um, each side has something that they can do to help the other side. The nobles can offer their resources to help the villagers solve problems, um, can offer advice, can help ordinary people in their daily lives. This is part of the feudal contract, the Fengjian It is a duty that nobles have to do once in a while. And it's called a visit of charity because the word charity originally came from the Latin word caritas. Yes, Microsoft knows this word, great. Caritas, which means love for your fellow Christian or love for your fellow human. It's not uh, from a higher position to a lower position. It's love for everybody. It's a love that you should feel for everybody in the world. So by using visits of charity, the nobles are saying, you villagers are equal to us nobles. We are all human, we're all Christians. We are all equal in the eyes of God. So if there's anything I can do to help you, please tell me. That's the logic uh, of these visits. And in fact, this is such an important part of the feudal society that it has a name. It's called noblesse oblige. Yes, Microsoft also knows this word. Uh, it's from the French, which means the duty of a noble. Uh, and we notice that it's Anne who does this. Anne goes on strolls of solitary indulgence, which means she goes on a walk by herself, in her father's grounds. Ground means land, so on her father's property. She doesn't say on her property. She doesn't say on her family's property. She says on her father's property. Because her father is the noble head of the house who actually owns Kellynch. Uh, and then the next item is a visit of charity in the village. So the story is actually putting these two together. Anne sometimes likes to walk alone. Sometimes on these walks, she will go visit the villagers, see if there's anything she can do to help them. So it feels like it's not a huge burden for Anne. She doesn't feel like this is something annoying. She doesn't want to get away from this duty. To her, it's a very normal thing to do and a very proper thing to do. But in the rest of the book, we never see anybody else in her family do this. Can you imagine Sir Walter going house door to door to say, how can I help you? Or Elizabeth. And then, of course, Mary is now a part of the Musgrove family. Um, but yeah, in this household, only Anne is human enough to care about their villagers. Question three, nobody took this question, maybe because it's not an easy question to talk about. So we know that Mr. Elliot used to be on bad terms with Sir Walter, but when Anne arrives in Bath, 
suddenly everybody is talking about Mr. Elliot, what a great guy he is. He comes every day. Uh, and when Anne says, wait, isn't he on bad terms with father? Uh, Elizabeth tells her, no, no, no. He came and apologized. It was a very great apology. So how exactly did he apologize? How did he get Sir Walter to take him back into the family? 9192. Um, okay, so starting here, this is uh, three paragraphs from the bottom. Right. Their former good understanding was completely reestablished. Understanding here means relationship. They had not a fault to find in him, so they also think he's the perfect man. He had explained away all the appearance of neglect on his own side, so he managed to find a way to 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 explain why it feels like he was ignoring his family, and he explained this in a way that Sir Walter could accept it. Here's his explanation. It had originated in misapprehension entirely. Misapprehension. Today we call this a misunderstanding. So his opening strategy is to say, oh, it was all a misunderstanding. Those are hui. He had never had an idea of throwing himself off. He never wanted to leave the family. He had feared that he was thrown off, but knew not why. <laughs> wow, this guy is tricky. He says, I didn't want to leave the family, but it felt, it felt like I was being kicked out, and I don't know why. So now he's blaming Sir Walter for quote unquote kicking him out. And delicacy, here it means politeness, had kept him silent. So why didn't he try to find out what's going on? Because it would be impolite. Right, think about this, right? If somebody suddenly ghosts you one day, blocks you online one day, are you going to go track them down and ask you, why did you block me? No, because that's stupid and it's very impolite. They already don't want to talk to you. Why would you track them down and make them explain why? Same logic. He says, I thought you hated me, so I didn't want to ask why. That would be very improper. Upon the hint of having spoken disrespectfully or carelessly of the family and the family honors. So the hint of means that somebody brought this up. So like the first point, why did you leave the family? He gives his reasons. The second point, why did you say bad things about our family? And now here is his response. He was quite indignant, righteously angry. He who had ever, which means always, boasted of being an Elliot and whose feelings as to connection or the family relationship were only too strict to suit the unfeudal tone of the present day. So the idea is he cares so much about family that it's not even fashionable anymore. In our culture, you might say somebody is too filially pious. That's what he's saying. This, this is the kind of person that I am. How could you say that about him? He was astonished indeed. But his character and general conduct must refute it. So his response is, look at what kind of person I am. Look at how I talk, how I behave. Can you really believe I would say something bad about our family? He could refer Sir Walter to all who knew him and certainly the pains he had been taking on this, the uh, pains here means effort. The pains he had been taking on this, the first opportunity of reconciliation, which means uh, to come together again, to be restored to the footing of a relation and heir presumptive. Footing here means position. Was a strong proof of his opinions on the subject, so he's saying like, look at what kind of person I am. Look at what how, my behavior. If you don't believe me, 
ask anybody who knows me. And also, if I really hated you guys, why would I come to apologize the moment that you arrived in Bath? Why would I be so quick to come and try to repair our family relationship? Uh, and here he, he also it says that he's the heir presumptive. We learned this in chapter one, right? If Sir Walter dies and the family has no men or boys, then the title of Sir Walter passes on to Mr. Elliot. Next point, the circumstances of his marriage. Apparently there's a rumor that, not a rumor, they know that Mr. Elliot married a commoner. So now he has to explain his marriage. The circumstances of his marriage too were found to admit of much extenuation. Extenuation means that he has reasons to explain why he had to do it this way. So it's not saying he was right. He's still wrong, but he had reasons to do it this way. Uh, extenuation. What do we call that in Chinese? Like if you, if I commit a crime and I tell the judge, I didn't want to steal, but I was poor and hungry. That kind of thing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, today we don't say extenuation. We say extenuating circumstances. This was an article or this was a like a, a point not to be entered on by himself. So he didn't want to do this. He didn't want to marry the woman. But a very intimate friend of his, a Colonel Wallace, a highly respectable man, perfectly the gentleman and not an ill looking man, Sir Walter added. So at this point, Sir Walter adds also Colonel Wallace, not too bad looking, looks pretty good. As we know, Sir Walter cares about how people look. Who was living in very good style in Marlborough buildings. Uh, and had at his own particular request been admitted to their acquaintance through Mr. Elliot. So Colonel Wallace wanted to be introduced to the Elliot family through the connection of Mr. Elliot. So this Colonel Wallace had mentioned one or two things relative to the marriage. Today we would say related to the marriage, which made a material difference in the discredit of it. Material difference means a significant difference. So this sentence is saying Colonel Wallace, great guy, respectable gentleman, looks pretty good, lives in a good place, good guy. He himself came to explain what's going on with Mr. Elliot's marriage and his explanation did make a difference. So what did Colonel Wallace say? Colonel Wallace had known Mr. Elliot long, had been well acquainted also with his wife, had perfectly understood the whole story. She was certainly not a woman of family. So her status was not very high. Uh, like a woman of family means a woman who comes from a good family. So she's not that, but well educated, accomplished, rich, and excessively in love with his friend, Mr. Elliot. There had been the charm. So like because of these reasons, Mr. Elliot also found her attractive. Um, she had sought him. Without that attraction, not all her money would have tempted Elliot. And Sir Walter was moreover assured of her having been a very fine woman. Fine here means beautiful. So once again, in this explanation, emphasizing not only is uh, not only was his wife rich, but also she was beautiful and also like a good person. Here was a great deal to soften the business. 
the business here is like the understanding of the marriage. So these reasons helped Sir Walter think better of Mr. Elliot's marriage. A very fine woman with a large fortune in love with him. Sir Walter seemed to admit it as complete apology. So like this was enough for Sir Walter. He could take he could accept all of it. And though Elizabeth could not see the circumstance in quite so favorable a light, she allowed it be a great extenuation. So this explanation was enough for Sir Walter. It was not enough for Elizabeth, but it was a great extenuation for her. So even though she still disagrees, it's not as serious as she used to think. Um, and so Mr. Elliot kept coming to visit them, had eaten with them, um, and he had performed his duties. He had seemed like a very um, welcoming and like welcoming family member. He he loves hanging out with them, basically. Placing his whole happiness in being on intimate terms in Camden Place. Camden Place is where the Elliot family is staying in Bath. So he enjoys spending time with them. And then if you look at all the other stuff that he said, apparently this was the perfect apology. So the question is, what values did he appeal to? So first of all, he said he didn't want to break with the family. He thought they broke with him. So first that's negating intention. And then he says he would never say anything bad about our family. So that's appealing to family honor and family pride. We know that Sir Walter really enjoys being an Elliot. So this is something that he cares about. And we also know that Elizabeth is basically just Sir Walter, but female. Uh, so it works for both people. Right. When he says he boasted of always being an Elliot, he loves being related to them, and he cares so much about his family that it's not fashionable anymore to care so much. And then he says, if you don't believe me, ask around. And I'm, you know, why else would I be here if I didn't love my family? So all he's talking about at this point is how much he loves the Elliot family. And then his marriage. This is also very sneaky. He doesn't explain his marriage himself. He gets his friend to come explain it. This is the correct way to do this. Because he doesn't have a perfectly good explanation. Right? It says that there were extenuations. Which means it's not as bad as you thought. But it's still not good. So like if you apologize to somebody and you say. You uh, and you're trying to say you're trying to get them to forgive you, but instead of saying you're right, I was wrong. You say no, no, it wasn't as bad as you thought. That doesn't help your apology. So instead of saying it himself, he gets Colonel Wallace to say it for him. Very sneaky guy. And so uh, Colonel Wallace praises Mr. Elliot's ex-wife. Basically, it, it, you can compare it to Mary's marriage. Mary also marries somebody who is not a noble, but they have lots of money. It's a great family. It's the best possible marriage she could have that is not a noble. Same thing for Mr. Elliot. Basically, his wife had everything except for a good family background. So it's also appealing to status. Just not noble status, every other kind of status. Right? She had money, she had accomplishments, she loved him. Um, that really gives her a much higher status than simply saying that she is a common person. Uh, but again, it still doesn't make her a noble. So Sir Walter says fine, but Elizabeth says, 
eh, okay, I'll accept it for now. She doesn't take it as a complete apology. So that's the first part of the question. Basically, Mr. Elliot appeals to the Elliot pride. The second part of the question, when he says the unfeudal tone of the present day, he's saying, you know, in the feudal system, you should stick with your family. You should support and protect your family. But he's saying that in the current period, in the current day, the social values are no longer so pure. It's still a feudal society, but people care less and less about supporting their family. Uh, and of course, you know, it, it's not a democracy. It's a feudal society. So according to Mr. Elliot, who wants to repair his family relationship, who wants to emphasize that feudal connection, calling the present day unfeudal, is to say that it is getting worse and worse, right? Society is getting worse and worse uh, according to this value. Question four. Why would Lady Russell think that Mr. Elliot had an unhappy marriage? Uh, well, Colonel Wallace later confirms that the marriage was unhappy, but how, why does Lady Russell guess this? Um, I'll give you the answer first, and then we can look at the evidence. The answer is because such a perfect man, he seems like the perfect man. How did he become so perfect? If you think about Lady Elliot, she was the perfect woman, took care of the kids, took care of the house, took care of her husband, took care of her husband's reputation. And so Lady Elliot was doing that. Therefore, Sir Walter didn't have to take care of his own reputation. So after Lady Elliot died, Sir Walter is the same prideful idiot that we see today. So if that was a good, happy marriage, it produced a prideful idiot. Well, now we have the perfect man, Mr. Elliot. And so Lady Russell uses the same logic. He's so perfect, he must not have had a good wife to help take care of his reputation. He must have had to take care of his own reputation. He had to learn how to be so perfect. Nobody was helping him. Therefore, he must have had an unhappy marriage. That's the logic. Let's look at the evidence. When we look at, we're going to look at a list of how perfect Mr. Elliot is. When we go through this list, think about which elements could have been done by his wife. Which parts of his character and behavior could have been helped by a good wife? Um, so, can this, uh, I'm on the bottom of 96, can this be Mr. Elliot and could not seriously picture to herself a more agreeable or estimable man? Estimable here just means good. Um, it comes from the word esteem. We see the word esteem today most co commonly in the word self-esteem, which means self-confidence. Uh, so esteem means to value something to as, as the verb to esteem something is to value something. So to esteem a person is to value that person. Estimable means that this person is worth valuing. So basically the idea is a good man. Everything united in him. He had everything. Good understanding, correct opinions knowledge of the world, and a warm heart. He had strong feelings of family attachment and family honor without pride or weakness. Uh, so this is talking about his feelings for the Elliot family. 
He lived with the liberality of a man of fortune without display. So he lived life freely like someone with money, but he didn't show off his money. He judged for himself in everything essential. So in every important point, he makes his own judgments. Without defying public opinion in any point of worldly decorum. At the same time, his judgments never go against public opinion in any point of being polite. So even if he doesn't agree with most people, he presents his ideas in a very polite way. He was steady, observant, moderate, candid, which means honest. Never run away with by spirits or by selfishness, which fancied itself strong feeling. So mm -hmm. run away with is in the passive voice, as it Beidong Yuchi, to be run away with. In other words, he never lost his head. Uh, spirits means alcohol. So when he drinks, he doesn't lose himself. And then the second thing, selfishness, which fancied itself strong feeling. So the idea is some people who act selfishly think that it's not being selfish, it's just being passionate. But really, it's being selfish. So, uh, Mr. Elliot does not do that. And yet, with a sensibility to what was amiable and lovely. So he had a feeling for what is good and, and lovely and a value for all the felicities of domestic life. So he would, could also appreciate all the happiness, felicities, happiness of household life, living at home, home life. Felicity, uh, this word which means happiness comes from the Latin through the French. Um, Today, even in French, if you wish somebody happiness, you would say felicite. Uh, you can also see this in Spanish. The name Felix, it, it means happiness. Uh, if you wish somebody happy Christmas, Feliz Navidad in Spanish. Right, so happiness. Uh, and this kind of happiness is something that characters of fancied enthusiasm and violent agitation seldom really possess. So people who think of themselves as passionate and who are easily excited don't really have that feeling for domestic happiness. Today we call this domestic bliss. And because he's such a perfect man, Lady Russell was sure that he had not been happy in marriage. Like, OK, some of these are great for men to have, but some of these traits are usually associated with good women in that society, right? Domestic life, a sensibility to what was amiable and lovely. Um, so you and then like. Yeah, so he had like good traits that are usually considered masculine and good feminine traits. He had to do both sides, so he must have had an unhappy marriage. Continuing, Colonel Wallace said it, said that he had an unhappy marriage, and Lady Russell saw it in his character. But it had been no unhappiness to sour his mind. You know, some people who are in an unhappy marriage, their personality gets twisted. They become cynical. Here, this did not happen to Mr. Elliot. Nor, uh, OK, that the next part doesn't is not related to our question. Uh, OK, and then question five. How is Anne? How does Anne have more pride than any of her family members? Uh, a few groups also took this question. 
So this is where she is talking with Mr. Elliot about why she doesn't want to join her family in visiting Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret, the two really important noblewomen who come through Bath. Um, so if we begin here, Lady Russell confessed that she had expected something better. So Lady Russell was also disappointed in the actual people of Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret. But yet it was an acquaintance worth having. <laughs> so like Lady Russell is basically holding her nose to go visit them. Uh, Lady Russell knows that they're not exactly good people to um, have a relationship with, but she knows that it's a good thing to be considered related to them. So Lady Russell does the expected thing. But Anne disagrees. When Anne ventured to speak her opinion of them to Mr. Elliot, he agreed to there being nothing in themselves. So they both agree that these two people are not really like better people. But Mr. Elliot still maintained that as a family connection, uh, and notice that today we spell the word connection differently, right? Today we spell it C-T-I-O-N. As a family connection, as good company, as those who would collect good company around them, they had their value. So Mr. Elliot adds two more reasons on top of Lady Russell's reasons. Yes, it's good to be related to these people, but also uh, because it is good to know them, you, we can consider them good company. And because everybody agrees it is good to know them, you might find yourself among a group of people who are worth knowing and uh, meeting. They collect good company around them. And then Anne smiled and said, my idea of good company, Mr. Elliot, is the company of clever, well-informed people who have a great deal of conversation. That is what I call good company. So Anne cares about people who are smart, who know things about the world, and who can hold a conversation. None of these are related to status. And then Mr. Elliot replies, you are mistaken, said he gently. That is not good company, that is the best. Uh, and then they start talking about all the different elements that make for good company and best company, how they judge different people. Uh, and after this conversation, she, uh, Anne adds, I certainly do think there has been by far too much trouble taken to procure the acquaintance. So she's saying, OK, fine, it, there are some benefits to knowing these people, but we have spent too much effort on this thing. Pro um, yeah, let's let's talk about the English. To take trouble. Right to to take effort, procure means to acquire to get. By far just means very much. And then she continues. I suppose, smiling. She does not say the word smiling. Smiling is Jane Austen talking to us. It's Jane Austen telling us that Anne is smiling as she says this. I suppose I have more pride than any of you. But I confess it does vex me. It does trouble me that we should be so solicitous to uh, here. You can say eager, so eager to have the relationship acknowledged, which we may be very sure is a matter of perfect indifference to them. So we're spending a lot of effort trying to know them. They don't give a shit about us, and that makes Anne feel very troubled. So from this, why does Anne think 
that she is so prideful? Why does she have? Can we say that she has pride? Well, she disagrees with everybody. Everybody says we should get to know these two women. Lady Russell says this. Sir Walter definitely says this. And Mr. Elliot says that they have their value. And when Mr. Elliot says that they uh, collect good company around them, this tells us that most people in that society, in that uh, class, also think it's a good idea to make the acquaintance of these two women. So when Anne says no, there's nothing valuable about them. She's not just going against her family. She's going against the entire nobility of England. She's proposing a completely different value system. And she believes that she's right. She believes that she knows what it truly means to have good company. That does sound arrogant. That does sound like pride. Um, I was talking with a few groups about this. Uh, one group mentioned that, um, yes, it does sound arrogant, but it's her values. It's what she truly believes. She's not trying to pretend to be proud. She's being honest with herself. Um, and at the same time, Jane Austen perhaps disagrees. This is perhaps one of the few points in the novel where Jane Austen says, OK, Anne maybe is a little too perfect, a little bit too idealistic. She's one person in this society who believes the opposite of everybody else. She must be missing something. Like a good relationship to a famous person is not worthless. It might not be very valuable compared to having a good friend, but it's not worthless. Um, so according to this group, Jane Austen seems to be saying that only somebody as perfect as Anne has the right to feel like this, to have this kind of value system. But since most of us are not perfect people, we should care a, at least a little bit about the kind of people that we know and like their reputation and status. Again, doesn't have to be the most important thing, but it does have some value. Uh, I was talking with another group about this question, and they pointed out that the fact that Anne could say this, the fact that Anne could choose a different value system, tells us that she is a noble. If she were a common person, and she said something like, Oh, I don't care about status. I care about good conversation. Would anybody care about that? No, it would be absolutely unimportant at all. So the fact that Anne can say this and it has some kind of effect on Mr. Elliot and it's considered maybe dangerously prideful. All of this tells us that Anne is making this judgment from the position of being a noble. Which is also a very interesting thing to point out. Anne is high enough in status to have the privilege to disagree with everybody else. You can even say she has the social capital or the the uh, yeah the social capital to disagree with everybody else. OK, do you have other thoughts about these questions? All right, so that took a bit longer than I thought. Next week, please finish up to chapter 20. Yes, up to chapter 20. See you next week.